All right, everybody, this is Ross Ratty. Welcome back to another episode of Fruit Talk. I greatly appreciate that you guys are here joining me for this week's episode. This is the podcast style video uh, that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. We love to talk about fruits and vegetables and how to use some of this stuff in the kitchen, but mainly how to grow it. And a lot of the weird and interesting things that you guys may not have exposed yourselves to just yet. And uh, in today's episode of Fruit Talk, we're going to be talking about the melon as we've actually talked about melons on the podcast a couple times now, at least once where we have mentioned Amy Goldman's book. It's called uh, Melons for the Passionate Grower. And this is a book that I picked up and I got really interested in because it, it does give you a short little breakdown of how to grow melons. Uh, not as much in-depth information as I would have liked, but it does break down a lot of the many heirloom varieties of melons that you can grow here in the United States. Um, that, in all honesty, some of them uh, I'm sure have really great flavor to them, really interesting characteristics, interesting genetics. And to me, that was a, a really awesome thing to come across her book. I, I highly recommend it. We've also mentioned here on the podcast my little Japanese trip, my J- my Japan trip that we uh, we went on a couple years ago, and we got this pretty much this eight course meal for dinner. I was staying at a ryokan, and they at the end of the meal they gave us a a melon, just a nice little slice of melon, and I was like, this is kind of strange because of all the things that they were serving to us throughout the meal. Um, this to me just seemed weird and I had, we had previously been walking around the different cities of Japan and seeing all the different markets and you just get the sense that obviously Japan is really prideful about their fruit. They put a lot of care and attention to it and people are willing to pay high prices for really high quality fruit, um, especially if they're going to be given as a gift. That's kind of what they're mainly used for in Japan. It's uh Unfortunately, it's not really something that everybody, I guess, has the most access to, which in a way is kind of a downside. But I think every country, every grower should be putting the amount of care and attention into their fruits that some of these Japanese growers are. So I thought that was really impressive. And um, yeah, so definitely um, after eating that melon, I was just over, I was just shocked. I was, I couldn't believe how good they were. Um, and we, you know, walking around the, the cities, it was $10 minimum for one melon. So I was like, holy crap, you know, that's why are they so expensive? But now I finally, I got it, you know, I understood it. And then having that awesome experience with the melons, I just couldn't help get that feeling that we've had here since the beginning, since we started this podcast, since we started growing food of just basically being deprived and being um, upset with uh, the current state of food and what's in our grocery stores here in the United States. And so I made it my mission. You know, it's been really a mission of mine to grow, to have that experience of Japan here in the Philadelphia area. And I have to say, it's been quite difficult. <laughs> so we finally have actually gotten some melons now to ripen in our yard. This right here is a photo of a variety called Savor, which is a hybrid from Johnny's. It's not an heirloom. And I'll get into uh, in a minute here why we've moved away from the heirlooms. But this hybrid here, um, is also a Charente type melon, which is a type of cantaloupe. So there's really two different types of melons that you're going to be looking for that are, of course, not watermelons and the other different types of melons. There's many different types, but the main two that you're going to look for in terms of what we have here in the United States, everybody knows honeydew, everybody knows cantaloupe. There really is no such thing as honeydew. Um, Cantaloupe actually is what you're looking at here. The Savor melon is a cantaloupe in that they have a smooth exterior with no netting, and usually they have ridges in the sides like a pumpkin. So they resemble a pumpkin. Obviously, they're different colors and all that. 
Um, the flesh is obviously very different, but the outside is a lot like a pumpkin. And then a musk melon is the other type of melon, which are the melons that have the netting on the outside. So cantaloupe that we find in the United States and honeydew that we find here, both of those are really technically musk melons. So um, interesting little tidbit there, but um, the reason why we've decided to grow some more of these hybrid types is because we've been failing for the last year. We really got into these, as I mentioned, and I decided through the help of Amy Goldman's book is to really go through this whole thing and and actually just flip through the pages and really get as much information about these varieties as I could. And I got really excited and I grew probably around 15 to 18 different varieties of heirloom melons only to find out that we just didn't succeed really much at all. We had limited success with our melons that we let them sprawl out along the ground. And those I had a decent harvest from. A lot of them, however, didn't seem like they ripened to perfection and others I had picked early. Um, so it was a bit difficult in my mind to kind of get them for whatever reason a success last year um, regardless of how they were grown either sprawled out on the ground or even trellised up and grown vertically um, it was a challenge and we and we basically failed so then I said well in order to really help my success my chances of success I can either do one of two things is one I can do some grafting which if you do some grafting onto a squash rootstock you end up having a more fusarium wilt resistant plant and um, to me, I don't necessarily, I haven't really gotten into that just yet. It seems like a whole lot of work. I'm sure it's not as difficult as it may seem at first. I'm sure it's actually quite easy, but for me, I'm not really into that just yet. So I said, you know what? We'll try and grow some hybrids that are very disease resistant, that have uh, high resistance to fusarium wilt races zero through two. So those are really what I'm looking for because the, the fusarium wilt is really the biggest killer here. Obviously, you've got some um, you know, some issues with powdery mildew because it's so humid here. And if the leaves don't dry quickly, you will eventually get some powdery mildew and that's not good. Um, that to me is not the end of the world, or at least it wasn't the end of the world. I was more concerned because we just had failed so miserably with the cucumber beetle spreading the fusarium wilt that to me was the worst thing that really happened last year. So I wanted to solve that problem. I didn't want to have the same issues again. So we grew the, the hybrids and, and one of them here is called Savor, as I mentioned. Here it is, it is on Johnny's website. You'll see here that it has high resistance to Fusarium wilt, races zero through two. And then we also grew another variety called uh, Sarah's Choice which also has very high resistance to fusarium wilt. So I haven't seen any wilt this year, and I've seen plenty of cucumber beetles. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that I had been spraying silica, silicon. Uh, we've talked a lot about that in a number of our videos now. That was, I think, the biggest difference maker with these plants this year and how they've been able to perform so well. Really all of my annual vegetables. Having silica or silicon in the soil has been so amazing. So um, yeah, it's it just is what it is. And I think maybe going forward with that spray, I might be able to get away with growing some of these varieties that aren't grafted and are maybe not as resistant to fusarium wilt. We're going to have to play around with that and take my chances and really make, I think, some decent decisions because what I found, even though I grew Savor, which is a Charente type melon, and it has, you know, it should be very tasty. I mean, um, superb eating quality, as it says, the sweetest French, French melon, as it mentions here on Johnny's website, Sarah's Choice is as they say their most flavorful cantaloupe consistently comes out on top of our on-farm taste tests yet the both of them really have not been all that great over the last couple of weeks i've been harvesting many many melons now 
I'm picking them to perfection. I know exactly when to pick them. Um, there's not an issue with that. I know, uh, you know, we've been putting them in the fridge. We've been doing all kinds of things that at least I would think they should be pretty much perfect. And they're just slightly above store-bought quality here in the United States. So by no means is it anywhere close to the quality of a Japanese melon. I've just been very, very upset, honestly, uh, to put in all this work to then find out that it just isn't as good as I thought, or at least I was hoping they were going to be. Here's a... Uh, this other one here is Sarah's Choice. Uh, this again is a musk melon from Johnny's, a hybrid. So I figure in order to get the, to have success, you know, and have this same quality that you would expect from these melons, homegrown, um, you know, maybe under more ideal conditions or maybe we're going to have to play around with this, but it's definitely not at the quality of Japan. So how am I going to achieve this? I don't know. And that's kind of what I want to talk about here in this video, this episode of, of Fruit Talk, because this has been on my mind really the last couple of days. This is the most interesting, exciting thing, I think, um, that's been going on in the yard. So um, I've been going through Amy Goldman's book here and... There is one melon that uh, has really the highest bricks of the cantaloupes and of the musk melons that seems like really it's going to have that better flavor that I'm hoping for because, you know, there's a lot of variety out there. Uh, not all of them are going to be as sweet as others. The genetics, as we all know, if you've been listening to this podcast for any length of time, the genetics are pretty much everything. Um, now, obviously, there's some growing conditions and techniques that we're going to have to change, I think, as well. But overall, the the um, you know growing them under the right genetics, having the right genetics, is extremely important. And she says here, actually, in her book, in the back, is a whole section on the melons, and there's just more details about each one. And she basically talks about. The bricks, flavor notes, like let me read one here. It's called uh, Picnic is the name of the melon. She gives the Latin name, the size, the weight, the sugar content, the maturity, which time of the year it ripens, uh, the source of her seed, and then just an additional little bit of notes on the particular, um, particular melon. This one here, by the way, interesting variety of melon, which I've just recently heard about. It's called the strawberry watermelon, and it just is right here in the book. Um, so, you know, it says here, of 30 watermelon varieties exhibited at the New York State Agricultural Fair, strawberry was judged the sweetest according to Burpee's 1985 Farm Annual. So um, it has a nine... Bricks content, which isn't really all that high. Um, let me see if real quickly if some of these other watermelons are getting much much sweeter. Here's ten and a half. Moon and stars is at ten. Here's one that's at eleven. So it's about average bricks. I wouldn't say it's probably the sweetest, but what I have heard about the strawberry watermelon, and I'm gonna try to find seeds because I want to think I'm gonna grow that one next year. Is that it actually? Here's one with 12 bricks, actually. Orange glow with a, with 10 bricks. But um, it's named strawberry because it actually tastes like strawberries, which I found to be really interesting. So we're going to try to grow, I think, more of these melons next year, of not just the musk melons and the cantaloupes, but also the, uh, the watermelons. But if I go through the cantaloupes and the musk melons here in, in the back, and even just through her book, it seems like the Petite Grise de Rene has got the highest bricks. It's at 14 bricks, which if you look through most of these, there's not many that are at 14. There's one or two at 14 and a half, but I don't think they're of the same quality that you're going to find in the Petite Grise. Um, and if you read in her book, the Petite Grise here, by the way, here's a photo of the Petite Grise on Seed Savers Exchange. Um, 
you know, it's really it, it is highly regarded as one of the best cantaloupes or melons in the world. She says here, petite grease is so good it gives me chills. As wonderful as the as Sharon Tay is, petite goes a bit uh, goes a baby step further, making it la creme de la creme of French melons. You'll blink your eyes with disbelief when you sample its sweetness, which is more like brown sugar than white sugar. It'll melt in your tongue and your mouth will water for more. That's exactly what I want right there. I want a melon that has really high sweetness, good fragrance, complex. Um, that brown sugar probably is giving it, giving it some nice complexity to it. And also the texture. Melts in your mouth. Sounds exactly like what I want. As in a lot of these fruits and vegetables, guys, especially our Mar de Bois strawberries, they melt in your mouth. Of the highest quality figs I, I eat, in terms of cold de dom, they have the perfect texture, right? So we're looking for the perfect texture. Uh, it says here the melon is a tableau vivant of impressionistic mustard and olive and inspires devotion in France. The little gray melon named for its appearance before ripening was noted in the garden of Bishop of Rennes, Rene nearly 400 years ago. It thrived in a mild climate and horse manure of the garrison town, but is now cultured in hothouses and polyester tunnels. It is both labor intensive and costly to produce despite the best efforts and uh, a handful of farmers and chefs. Petite grease is menaced by market forces that doesn't discourage the Reskin family of Cezanne Savin, who has grown Petite Grease for more than 75 years. Uh, let's see here. It says, though, however, for this group of preservationists, quality control is critical, so they made a science of what once came naturally. Um, melon plants are grafted onto squash rootstock to deal with Fusarium wilt, and then a sp a to keep them off the ground. Obviously, trellised off the ground is going to make such a better difference in terms of the disease resistance. Um, grown this way, Petite Grease de Rene doesn't see the light of day or touch the earth, but it um, is hardly factory farming. Kid gloves guide the process every step of the way. Uh, maybe not; it's not as easy as to grow other melons, but you can cultivate it in your own garden, protect it from cucumber beetles. Uh, coddle it with spun polyester it's worth the extra effort and um, to me you know that seems like the really the only one I think that really does seem worth growing because if I don't know exactly maybe there's another reason why I'm not getting the sweetness that or the quality I would see in Japan off of my melons I'm sure there's a couple reasons but out of all the genetics out there, I think that one probably has the best genetics in terms of the flavor or close to it. Maybe there's something that's available that I don't know of. Maybe I can find a Japanese melon, some Japanese melon seeds that might prove um, just to be better. There is the Kitazawa Seed Company. Let's see if they have something here. They may have some melon varieties that would be of interest. Here we go. Sharon Tay, Japanese, Korean melons. So they have a Sharon Tay, it's called Hakucho. It's a superior melon. The oval shaped fruit has yellowish gray skin with no netting. 16% bricks. <laughs> All right, well, <laughs> I think we're going to try this. That's pretty crazy. Uh, let's see here. Here is the uh, two Japanese varieties. One is called Echiba Koji. Specialty variety dominates the netted melon in J market in Japan. Well, maybe this is it right here. The fruit is round, green skinned, fine net, matures over three pounds, thick, juicy green flesh, matures over 16 bricks. The, the sugar content will continue to rise regardless of the weather. Easy to grow, widely adaptable, and resistant to mildews and vine split. Interesting. The unfortunate part is that it's a hybrid, and I don't know where these people get their seeds from. So 
so maybe it's possible that uh, I don't know maybe they're saving their own seed and maybe that this isn't the original I don't know it's a good it's a I guess a thought here's another one here it's called new melon open pollinated round melon that's a Japanese specialty developed in the 1950s for a fragrance and sweet tasting fruit this one doesn't seem nearly as um, as interesting as the other one there's some Korean melons here but these don't look like your typical melon that you might want this one though has 17 bricks apparently crisp remarkably sweet golden yellow shape is oval um, open field with vertical support growing as recommended interesting strong resistance to powdery mildew race one and melon necrotic spot virus so yeah some of these and that's the thing is that some of these just may not be very resistant to to the fusarium will and that may again make things very very difficult um, now there is another thing here we've I think we may have covered this on an episode of fruit talk but there is other reasons potentially why we're not getting the the quality that we could and first off this is a Japanese website that details out the melon growing process that they do in their greenhouses they uh, they string them up grow them vertically and of course they're under cover what they also do is they they I don't know what the word is exactly I forget but they heat up the soil to a I think 160 degrees I could translate this website and find out for sure but it's a a very warm temperature that kills any fusarium wilt that might be in the soil so they sterilize the soil basically and then they plant the melons and then they start trellising them up and they keep them to one single stem um, they do some hand pollinating of their melons and they basically get one melon or two melons per uh, per vine which is spaced about every foot or every uh, foot and a half so for every square foot you end up getting one or two melons which is pretty solid production uh, if you think about even if you just did it like that if even if you limited you limited the number of melons to one or two maybe just one per vine um, you're pretty much solid um, in terms of production because if you think about how much these things sprawl out along the ground and how much you get out of that area I mean my melon area is 10 foot wide um, 10 foot by maybe 12 so that's a hundred and twenty square feet so out of a hundred and twenty square feet I'm maybe getting I don't know exactly how many but let's just say 15 to 20 melons um, which if you think about 120 square feet you could get easily 50 melons if you grow them vertically um, so the production is like you know totally different obviously I don't know exactly what happened but I know growing them vertically would definitely net me some higher bricks I have a feeling is that first off these leaves are probably giving the plants better photosynthesis uh, or more carbohydrates because they probably have better photosynthesis um, they seem to form larger leaves the health the leaves seem to just be healthier in general but also um, I find that for whatever reason um, last year by growing them vertically outside not in a greenhouse environment in a field the cucumber beetle just seemed to have better hiding spots almost like it, it just seemed like they could really do the damage they wanted um, 
I don't know. Maybe it was the fact the big difference maker this year was the fact that I sprayed some silica versus not. So I don't know. I really don't know what the deal is. Um, but it seemed like growing them vertically just wasn't an option last year. So maybe that's the only way, though, that I can get the higher bricks that I'm looking for. I don't know. So we're going to have to try a bunch of things, really. We're going to have to try some different stuff because even my melon plants that we talked about in our really our recent video that's going to come out soon, you see the field, you see the plot of 120 square feet. They used to be pretty shaded by corn plants, and the corn was 10 feet tall, and maybe that had some effect on the bricks. Just, again, in photosynthesis, not getting enough carbohydrates into those fruits. So the only other thing I can think of besides, well, let's see, genetics, growing them vertically versus growing them along the ground, limiting the number of melons on the vine could also have an effect. But really what I was, I think may have be the other piece of this is the water as you guys know when you deficit irrigate you dry farm your fruits even some of your vegetables they become sweeter they uh don't uptake as much water and therefore they have a higher bricks so the same thing could be said for these melons in that maybe i have to find a way to lower the water but to be perfectly honest with you, it's been relatively dry here for most of the summer up until about three weeks ago. It really just started to rain. So I don't know really if I could make that argument. Um, and some people would probably argue against it and say, oh, well, melons need a ton of water because they're mostly water, right? But I'm sure there's a base amount of water that they need and anything in excess is probably lowering the bricks. Um, so anyway, guys, that's sort of our little melon update here and we're going to keep trying and keep you know trying different methods and and doing different things and trying to figure out what is the best thing for us for me to get this experience back here in the United States and you know who knows maybe at some point if these things are so good and I can make this an easier process maybe there's a future in it in terms of growing them commercially I think Honestly, there's a probably an untapped market of melons here in the United States because they're so low quality. And if you were to just taste one of these melons that I had in Japan, you'd be like, you'd be hooked. You'd be shocked. You'd be losing your mind. You'd be doing what I'm doing right now. Um, so, yeah, hopefully some of you guys are having some success. I know inspired. I inspired some of you guys to do the same thing. And um, let me know how you guys are doing with that. I know um, Adam and uh, Dimitri were doing it last year. Let me know how you guys were are doing with it this year. Getting a lot of production though, you know. Um, so even though the flavor is not all that great, I am getting quite a bit of of melons this year. So at least there's that. Um, at least I know that the Savor and the Sarah's Choice they do grow pretty darn well here, considering you know the lack of flavor. They do really grow um pretty darn well so at least for the future i know that these two could have a home um a more permanent home but yeah thank you guys here so much for watching this this video this episode of fruit talk tune in again this week i hope to see everybody next week if you're interested you want to support the channel consider supporting us on patreon uh the support on patreon it keeps growing and i'm just so happy that uh some people are so willing to help support me and um, you know really get the information that I am learning or um, experiencing myself and and get it out there to you guys. So you know it's it's sort of a I'm doing a service and I hope I know that people recognize that you know the service is worth something and um, I do appreciate that. It means a lot. Um, also, guys, you know if you're listening to this on iTunes or some other podcasting site. Um, consider rating us or giving us a review or something. I don't know how that all works, but I'll see you guys, see you guys soon. All right. For next week. Uh, take care.